Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to take part in this tech summit. Um, what I want to do today particularly is to talk about this magic word, innovation. It's everywhere. I'll give you 30 seconds on any company website before you see this magic word. You know the kind of thing. Innovation, driving the business. Innovation, working for our customers. Innovation, innovation, everywhere. And of course, these days in the public sector, it's the same thing. How do we deal with the huge challenges facing us? Hmm, innovation. How do we make innovation happen? How do we manage it? Now, let me give you a simple definition of innovation. For me, innovation is translating knowledge to value. Whether that's economic and commercial value or social value, that's what innovation is about. Much of my research these days is in the humanitarian sector. I work with people like Save the Children and the Red Cross. Their challenge is just the same. How do we solve problems? How do we convert knowledge to value? Now, the good news is we know quite a lot about how to do this. We've got about 100 years worth of research on managing innovation. And I stress this is not simply an armchair academic thing. Most of what we've learned has come the hard way. What I'd like to do today, very briefly, is to throw down some challenges. A bit like an 18th century dualist, I'm going to throw down some gauntlets and invite you to pick them up, to think a little about these challenges. So I'm going to try and deal with, first of all, the Spengler challenge, then I'll move on to the sideways challenge, and we'll finish with the, we can in a minute, the spaghetti challenge. Now, that might look a little strange, I will explain as we go along. So perhaps we could begin with the Spengler challenge. Let me ask you, when did you last use your Spengler? Mr. J. Murray Spengler invented and patented the electric vacuum suction sweeper. Nobody has ever heard of him. But if I said the word sewing machine, I think a name just dropped into your heads, which is? Singer, all together now, singer. That's what most people say. Unfortunately, you're all wrong. Because actually, it was a man called Elias Howe who invented the sewing machine. He went bankrupt. Mr. Singer bought the business. Innovation is not like the cartoons. You know in the cartoons, bing, light bulb flashes on, great. That's an idea. It's not innovation. It's not creating value. Here's some examples of bright ideas which their authors believed so much were important that they put them in the patent office. For example, the great gas-filled umbrella. Hmm. The musical flamethrower. Hmm. I quite like this one. If you want to keep your unborn baby entertained for nine months, you strap a Walkman on your tummy. But I think I would give my star prize to the genius who felt the world needed the cheese-flavored cigarette. Now, you've seen this kind of stuff all over the internet, wacky inventions. But it reminds us of a really important point. Invention isn't enough. And it's part of a bigger challenge in innovation. Basically, how we think about something, the kind of mental model we have about it, is going to shape what we do about it, what we pay attention to, what we give resources to, what we manage. So if we take that word innovation, what's the model? If that model is simplistically, it's all about ideas, great. We'll pay attention to that, we'll give resources to it, but we may not create any value, we may just have lots and lots of wacky ideas. The idea of knowledge as a source of innovation. That's essentially why we do R&D. We create new knowledge to create new possibilities. Wonderful. That's a great thing to do. Sometimes we come up with wonderful ideas, wonderful technologies that don't find an use. So maybe there's a limitation to this important piece of the puzzle. OK, then let's flip it on its head. Let's listen to the market. Let's understand what the market wants. Let them pull the innovations through. Great idea, great principle, except that sometimes the market may not know what it wants. Very famous Henry Ford quotation, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have told me 
faster horses. Sometimes people can't imagine what's coming next. Think about Steve Jobs, he really got this. People don't know, but when they have that thing in their hands, they'll wonder how on earth they lived without it. When we say innovation in our companies, what do we actually mean? And are we working with a rich set of pieces or just one or two? And what we're going to do is play a game called Find the Lady. Now, this is nothing to do with going out night clubbing, but this is a very, very old thing. I'm sure you'll recognize it. It actually goes back to medieval times. It's a simple game. These guys, you can see, have some cups, and they have a little dice, and they're going to cover the dice and then shuffle the cups around. So your challenge, of course, is to watch where that dice went, try and keep track of it as the cups are shuffled, and predict where it ends up. And here we are, decision time, ladies and gentlemen. Where is that blue item? Have you made your bets? And ta-da, there it is. Would you put your hand up if you saw the gorilla? Great. Half of the audience have got their hands up and are looking quite smug. The other half are thinking, what the hell is he talking about? People with their hands up will support me. I'm going to play that again. I'm not going to switch the film. I'm going to play the same bit of film again. But this time, forget what's going on with the cups. Just relax, because what you're going to see in the background is not a real one. It's a guy in a gorilla suit who comes up, waves to you, and drops down again. So let's watch again. And as I say, you're normally set up to focus in. Your brains are going really hard, getting ready. And off we go. But now forget what's going on in the front. Just relax and look in the gap between those two guys' shoulders. Because any minute now, we're going to see a gorilla. It's not a little one, it's full size. Waves his head. Hello, everybody. Now, that is really scary. If you've not seen that before, you might be wondering what the hell is going on. We've got brilliant brains, but they haven't got infinite capacity, so we can't pay attention to everything in the world outside. What we know is important, what will threaten us, what we must react to, we'll have that model in mind and watch out, pay attention for things we expect to see. And that's great, it's helped to survive as a species, but it carries the risk that we miss something that is unexpected or surprising. In that case, because you don't normally expect to see a gorilla in that situation, you don't see it. We focus our limited attention on the things that matter. We have an innovation strategy. We watch competitors. We watch technologies. We keep focused. The challenge we've got is the sideways challenge. We might need to focus, but also to look out of the corner of our eye, to have peripheral vision. Ladies and gentlemen, the Red Queen, you've already heard about her a little. Um, whoops, as we go. Basically, the Red Queen's this wonderful character in Alice in Wonderland. Now, she's great, she's got this ability to think of impossible things before breakfast, wonderful like that. However, I would recommend if ever you meet her, do not play chess with her for three very good reasons. Firstly, she keeps changing the rules. You think you're playing by the rules of chess, she'll switch those rules on you. That's hard, but it gets harder because she'll change the game. You think you're playing chess and suddenly you're in something else. But that's not the real challenge. The biggest concern is, in her world, that's perfectly normal. That's life. It's a metaphor for this challenge of managing innovation. The problem never changes. Innovation is creating value from knowledge. The problem doesn't change, but the context does. And we're basically in a context, as we've already been hearing, full of multiple simultaneous sources of change. We can't pay attention to all of that. We can't, under these circumstances, trust to luck. We've got to manage innovation. We've got to get hold of it and do something about it in a thoughtful fashion. But we also need to build what, in the academic world, we call the only academic word for today, but we call this dynamic capability. And what we mean by that is very simply the ability to step back, look at the ways we're managing innovation, and reset them. 
not simply doing the same thing that we've always done, but stepping back and changing our approach to innovation. What we actually need is some kind of a process, some kind of a structure that takes us through, we hope, to success, but certainly which improves the odds in our favor. Now, you've almost certainly got some version of that kind of model operating in your organizations. I'm very happy with it. You'll find it in my textbook. You'll find it in my competitors' textbooks if you want to read them. I don't recommend it, but if you did. But basically, this is a picture of innovation it's a model that helps us think about and work with innovation. And that's great, as long as we don't forget one very important point. This is a model. It's like a map. And a map helps us get somewhere, but it's not the place itself. It's a simple representation. Because innovation doesn't happen like that. It happens like that. Now, don't worry if you can't see the detail. That is quite deliberate. I would like you to see spaghetti, because that's what innovation really is, knowledge spaghetti. It's technical knowledge, and market knowledge, and legal knowledge, and financial knowledge, all sorts of strands of knowledge held by different people inside and outside the organization. And our job, if we want to innovate, is to weave those strands together to create value. That's innovation. We can superimpose a structure on this, but we shouldn't forget what's going on underneath. Now, why is that important? Well, these days we're in a world that is drowning in knowledge. There is just a huge amount of this knowledge spaghetti there that we have to work with. Let's take technical knowledge. Now, we don't know how much technical knowledge there is in the world, but we do know how much new knowledge is created. We can measure R&D investment. And very roughly, every year around the world, we spend $1,600 billion creating new knowledge. Just think of that number. No matter how much you spend, it's a drop in the ocean. We are drowning in new knowledge, and it's coming at us year on year at that rate. Now, I suggest in that kind of world, it's not just what we do, but what on earth is out there that we might make use of? How might someone make use of our knowledge? It's a very different game. But of course, it's not just about technical knowledge. The whole thing in innovation is about the market. We're talking these days of seven plus billion people, and we don't understand all of them. There are strands of that spaghetti we've hardly yet begun to get to grips with, but we need to. So in our innovation game, we've got some very serious challenges, but some great opportunities. Now, the good news about it is we have a label for it. It's always good to put a label on something, and this is the world of open innovation. It's essentially about a multiplayer game where innovation happens no longer just inside the enterprise, but in a connected multiplayer world. Hugely important in all of this is connection, interactivity. It's about working with knowledge. It's not just new knowledge. Very often, it's about reusing knowledge that exists somewhere else that suddenly has moved to a different zone. And in organizations, particularly large ones like Liberty Global, this is a challenge as much inside the organization as outside. Question to think about. Inside Liberty Global, does this company know what it knows? The great thing about this, and we're learning a lot from a wide experience, is it's a really rich new opportunity around innovation. But how do we make it happen? Now, there's lots of opportunities. I'm just going to focus on three very briefly because they set up some interesting questions for us. So let's begin by this question of mobilizing minds. And I'd like you now to come with me in my time machine as we go back in time to the 17th century. Back in time. And we're now in London at the Admiralty, the headquarters of the Navy, where you can look and see some very worried men. They're very worried because they're in charge of the Navy, and they have this unfortunate problem. They keep losing their ships. And so they said, we've got to find a way to improve navigation. Now, the problem was fairly straightforward. We understand how to measure latitude. The thing we couldn't measure accurately was longitude. And the problem with longitude, very simply, was we couldn't tell the time. There were no accurate timepieces that could be put on a ship that would give you 
accurate measures of time so you could predict longitude. And so in desperation, they put up a prize worth a huge amount of money, close to a million pounds in today's money, and the King of England himself blessed it and said, does anybody have a solution to this problem? And a man called John Harrison came up with this beautiful thing. It's actually made of wood. You can see it still in London in the Greenwich Museum. But basically, he won the prize for a portable ship's chronometer. Now, back in our time machine, let's go forward 100 years to Emperor Louis Napoleon III of France. Now, he'd learned from his grandfather, Napoleon, that an army marches on its stomach. Now, the problem, of course, if you're trying to provision an army, is that food goes bad. In particular, butter goes bad if you try and keep it for long. So what you need for a modern army is a substitute for butter that doesn't go bad. Same thing, important question. The Emperor of France himself backing it, big prize, another competition. And as a result, we have margarine. We're in a world where crowdsourcing is increasingly normal. We can tap into knowledge inside and outside organizations and use that. Now, this is fascinating because it opens up all sorts of perspectives. There's been some very good research at Harvard Business School on idea platforms like this, and Karim Lakhani's studies show something rather interesting. You might think, huh, well, if all those people are going to do the thinking, we don't need to do it anymore. Innocentive have about a quarter of a million people actively solving in their community. That's a huge R&D resource. But companies don't use them simply to replace their own efforts. What they recognize is amongst those 250,000 people, there's a huge distribution of perspectives. They see your problem from all sorts of different angles. And the value is not a replacement of what you do, it's an amplification of what you can do. We're mobilizing variety. Now, I'd like to move to the second opportunity around co-creation. Uh, this is an old picture. It's a Model T Ford with one slight variation. I don't know if you can see, but this rather enterprising farmer has thought, if I get a few bits of wood and nail them to the car, I've got a little transporter. I can take the goat to market. And this farmer says, this farmer says, you know, I never use the back seats of my car, so I'll throw them out, and now I've got a transporter. I can take hay out to the fields. And this farmer said, the trouble in the, the cold winters of the Northwest, those iron wheels on the Model T are no use at all. What I need is a Model T snowmobile. There you have it. Now, the point about these, they're not Photoshop, they're real pictures. They remind us of something farmers do very much in their lives. Basically, they're improvisers. They want to get on with the job. They have two important characteristics. They have a high incentive to innovate. They want the outcome. And they don't care if it's not perfect. They're happy with a prototype that gets near enough. And they're what we call user innovators. They are so frustrated, or they so much want the innovation, they'll do something about it. At the extreme, of course, you get people like this gentleman. This gentleman had a very high incentive to innovate. He was dying. He had a particular heart condition where there was a procedure, but with a limited chance of success. If he didn't basically get something done, he was going to die. He's an engineer. Just like our farmers, high incentive, I might as well try. He designed and then persuaded a surgeon to implant a new valve. Thankfully, he's still alive. His name's Tal Goldsworthy. You can see a wonderful TED talk about him. But not only is he alive, but many other people have benefited from his innovation. It's this classic idea of users, first of all, solving their own problem, and then it becoming more widely used. It's interesting, it's what Eric von Hippel calls free innovation. These people are not looking to make their fortune from ideas. They just want to solve their particular problem. If you benefit as well, that's great. Now, why do users matter? It's worth just reflecting again briefly. Why users matter? They're a source of diverse ideas. It's this front end, lots of variety. Frustration is very often the mother of invention. They really understand the problem they want solved. They'll do something about it. This helps diffusion. One of the things we know about diffusion is people adopt ideas from other people like them. 
This compatibility issue of how do we make sure what we create fits will work with users, there's a good chance to accelerate diffusion. And if we're really clever, this provides a great basis for a long-term relationship, a partnership. A company like Lego works with its users. Its users are little boys and girls. But increasingly, Lego has said, what do you think? How would you use our Lego? Come up with your dinosaur, your robot. And through a variety of mechanisms, they've embraced users as active co-creators in the process building this rich, loyal community. Lego, of course, great thing. You start with an architecture around physical bricks, but on top of that, you bring in stories and perspectives and user co-creators, and now you've got the movie business. Essentially, you're building on a platform. Of course, with our smartphones, we're seeing something similar. The whole app economy is not about the phone. It's everything on that platform. And platforms essentially are knowledge intersection points. It's where that knowledge flows. It's where it's shared, exchanged, combined, traded. This is where it happens, on platforms. And it really is one of the devices, one of the mechanisms for enabling knowledge flow in our connected world. Now, I mentioned I do a lot of work in the humanitarian sector. I don't have a chance to go through all these examples, but this is really changing quite a lot, particularly around the mobile phone. Perhaps the bottom left picture, that's a picture, terrible, of Haiti after the earthquake back in 2010. This was a city, Port-au-Prince, absolutely shattered. Nothing was there, roads were closed, buildings collapsed and so on. Very, very quickly, with users creating and co-creating, a whole suite of apps emerged to run on mobile phones. Connectivity was established very quickly. Most people could get access, not necessarily a personal one, most people could get a phone. And very quickly, the response in that disaster to link up displaced people. Where's my children? Where's my parents? You could connect. To actually work out which streets were passable, this idea of open street mapping of distributing aid by transferring credits, by using this as a kind of mobile banking system. In all sorts of ways, this has become very, very quickly a tool for tremendous value in that kind of sector. But platforms are also meeting places. Now, this is another old picture. This is Brown's Coffee Shop in London. London in the 17th century had a fashion for coffee shops, and of course, a bit like Starbucks, people coming in, drinking coffee and chatting. The difference is that this particular place, Brown's, became a place where ideas for new ventures met up with people with money and other backers. It was the birth of the London Stock Exchange. Lloyd's of London began in Lloyd's Coffee Shop, the same thing, a meeting place for ideas where knowledge is traded, exchanged, and built upon. If we move our time machine forward to the 20th century, Walker's Wagon Wheel Tavern in Silicon Valley. We might have switched from coffee to beer, but the same thing is going on. The platform as a meeting place. Using platforms to bring knowledge together, to build communities. And perhaps I can be fanciful. In previous days, when we moved physical goods and services around, ports were important. Of course, innovation matters. We're very serious about creating value from knowledge. And it isn't going to happen just by accident. But we're trying to do this in the world of knowledge spaghetti, this fluid, connected, but still emergent world. In a space like that, we need this idea of what I call dynamic capability, being able to step back, review how we innovate, adapt, and change it. So now, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, there is no escape. I'm going to sing. So here we go. You like to think you're sitting on top of your technology. Your gadgets are smart and cool, cause you do lots of R&D. Your software's fast and your data's the best. Your packaging's cool, you can't forget all the rest. There's only one problem left at your door. Folks don't want your product no more. So you need dynamic capability. In innovation, it's got to be dynamic capability. 
At the heart of your philosophy You can't rely on the old routines To deal with problems that you've never seen In innovation, the key to creation Is keep on building up your dynamic capability You can sing dynamic capability Right, switch So, are you really using all of the knowledge that's out there? Trying new ways to open up, learning how to share. Not all the smart guys are working for you. You need to network, let ideas flow through. If you're not ready to change what you know, it won't just be your innovation that's closed. So you need dynamic capability and there it, it, it's got to be whoops dynamic capability at the heart of your philosophy you can rely on the old routines to deal with problems that you've never seen in innovation the key to creation is keep on building up your dynamic capability Dynamic capability. Sorry, it's only one more verse. When Henry Ford started making cars, we didn't have a voice. But now we don't just want Model T's, we want lots of choice. We're all looking for customization. Out on the streets, the word is co-creation. Users can innovate, give them their say. But if you don't listen, they'll just walk away. Your last chance. So you need dynamic capability. In innovation, it's got to be dynamic capability. At the heart of your philosophy, you can't rely on the old routines to deal with problems that you've never seen. In innovation, the key to creation is keep on building up your dynamic capability. Dynamic capability. Dynamic capability. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Using the app. So you've, you've asked a few questions. Let's put up the first question on the screen. And that question is, is it more economical to invest in innovation development or to acquire innovation? It's a great question. Um, one of the challenges in open innovation is we began to realize just how much knowledge was out there. And of course, that then does set you up for saying, OK, maybe we don't have to do it. Maybe we'll just go shopping. It's not as easy as that. Yes, of course, there are tremendous opportunities out there. There's no point reinventing the wheel. But the challenge is making sure you find it, so you've got to actively go hunting for it, but also that you understand it. There's a phrase in innovation studies, I'm trying not to be academic, but it's called absorptive capacity. And basically, what it means is if you want to take on new knowledge, you actually have to understand what you're doing in order to make sense of that knowledge. So actually, unless you do your own innovation, unless you have your own investments in this area, it's unlikely that a long-term strategy simply of buying in is going to work. If you do your own, then you're able to see what you're missing, where a partnership, a collaboration could work. So it's not a case of either or, it's both. It's both, thank you. Yeah. When you work in the same job for years and conditioned to think in a certain way, how do you suddenly think outside the box? Whether it's as an individual or as an organization, it's very easy to become bounded. Um, there's that wonderful joke, uh, I'm not a comedian, bear with me, but you come out of the pub and you see somebody obviously very drunk, but very upset. He's hanging on the lamppost, scrabbling on the floor, desperately unhappy. So you come out of the pub, you say, what on earth is the matter? What's going on? Why are you crying? I've lost my keys. I don't know what I'll do. I've lost my keys. My wife will kill me. Relax. It's all right. I'll help you. Now, where did you lose your keys? And he hangs on his lamppost, and he points out in the distance to the car park over there. Uh, they're over there somewhere. Hang on a minute. If your keys are over there, why are you looking here? Ah, because there's more light here under the lamppost. 
Now, I said I'm not a comedian, but hold the metaphor. This is part of the problem. If we're a good organization, if we're good at our job, we know our lamppost area really well. We won't get surprised there. We know which technologies to watch, which competitors to watch. We have the innovation thing clear. But it's precisely not there that we might need to be looking. So we've got 360 degrees of darkness to explore. So to answer this question, one of the ways of thinking out of the box, of course, there are some short-term fixes, some wonderful creativity techniques, but one of them is to get out, to go out and explore. Increasing number of companies send people out essentially as scouts, but to change them, to change their perspective. Um, how about a big Ziggo Dome? Thank you for Professor John Thank Beck. you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.